and importance of communication. As organizations and as people, we can achieve amazing things only when we work together. But that is only possible when we have very clear and authentic, honest communication about our goals and the challenges and opportunities that we all face. Partnerships and co-creation will drive the next frontier of fintech. At Prudential, we are collaborating with the fintechs to reimagine our business and to help people get the most out of life. We want to use AI and data to understand our customers better, help them plan for the future with confidence and by being a trusted partner in health and wealth. At the same time, we want to empower our financial consultants with tools to better provide a seamless service for all of our customers. Where would your platform be if you can reach new customers, bigger networks, the world? Where would your platform be if you can take it beyond borders, towards success, towards endless possibilities? Imagine one connection, multiple markets, endless growth. The new normal requires a new solution. Proxterra bringing the world to you.
Where would your business be if you can reach more people, bigger markets, the world? Where would your business be if you can take it beyond borders, towards success, towards endless possibilities? What would happen if you can have the entire world at your fingertips? The new normal requires a new solution. Proxterra, bringing the world to you. New normal brings about new problems, both for you and your customers. As the CEO of a B2B platform, you know this better than anyone. But the new normal has also brought you a new solution, a solution that will help you create value and solve the challenges your customers are currently facing. Introducing Proxterra, an open global network that connects your platform to other platforms and trade services, bringing your customers a new world of possibilities. This is what Proxterra can do for you. Let's take a closer look at Neha, one of your customers. Neha, like many others, owns a local business a sundry store that sells daily necessities. With COVID-19, it's been difficult for her to get milk powder and other new products from her existing suppliers. Neha feels like she has no other option. Now let's reimagine Neha's story with Proxterra, the power of a global reach. By connecting your platform to Proxterra, you can give Neha options. Now, as Neha searches for milk powder, she is presented with a world of opportunities. Opportunities you have brought to her through the Proxterra network. All filtered to what she wants, all relevant to what she needs. Neha's options have just been expanded with new suppliers on other platforms, both locally and globally. She is now able to find the right product for her customers, and more importantly, at the right price, through you. By connecting your platform, Proxera enables Neha to connect with other platforms beyond yours. It also doesn't stop there. Proxera also helps overcome financing, logistics, and payment challenges faced by your customers. So connect to Proxera today, and you will find that there is nowhere in the world that's out of reach. Proxera, bringing the world to you. In our next session, we'll speak to key leaders working to build digital national infrastructure in order to ensure that everyone can participate and thrive in a digital economy. The panel discussion will be moderated by Conan, Senior Advisor for Digital Finance for the Institute of International Finance. His panel will consist of Her Excellency Sire, Assistant Governor of National Bank of Cambodia, Ben Bank of International Settlements lead on digital identity and cross-border payments, and co-founder and chief evangelist of Setu, Nikhil. We'll now join Conan for the panel discussion on building digital national infrastructure. Thank you very much. As we know, digital transformation continues to accelerate in our society, and it's really important that uh, we build the right foundation and infrastructure to make sure that that transformation can reach everybody in our society and that everybody can participate. And for this panel, we have, you know, as you just heard, an excellent uh, array of speakers who have really been helping to build that new next generation of national digital infrastructure in a number of settings. And I think, you know, as, as we think about why this is so important, 
Um, you know, we hear about a lot of the small businesses of the world being really stressed through this COVID crisis. And, you know, even before the crisis, the OECD noted that a 10% increase in bilateral digital connectivity raises trade services by 3.1%. 3 and SMEs, you know, employ between 60 and 90% of people in the economy, depending on the market that you're in, but they only have about 1.1% uh, 1 of global exports. And um, however, if you have an internet connected SME, about 90% of those uh, engage in export or cross-border activities. So in this new digitized world, it's really essential that we have this next generation infrastructure. And one of the things that I thought we'd uh, start off um, the conversation with is really that human impact. And there's no one really better um, to help us understand the human impact of what next generation payments and, and uh, underlying foundational infrastructure can bring um, than Her Excellency Surya Che, the Assistant Governor at National Bank of Cambodia. So Surya, I was wondering if you could start us off with a little bit of that view of the human impact and the on the ground real examples of what this uh, new infrastructure can enable. Thank you, Conan, for the introductions and uh, really a great honor to join you here at the Singapore FinTech Festival. Um, I think we all talk about, uh, if I, I, I stretch a bit about the infrastructures, probably um, I want to uh, stretch it towards the access to uh, electricity and stable uh, internet connections. That's very essential for uh, developing countries. Uh, it may be taken for granted, uh, but it is not for uh, many of us uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, developing world. Um, this is something that policymakers may probably need to think about in terms of infrastructure investment, where um, would you invest in uh, hard infrastructure, road and bridges, or the soft infrastructure, which is the digital connectivity. Um, you may want to do the hard infrastructure for the uh, rural area and probably digital uh, connectivity for the urban area, but that is something that we need to think about uh, seriously given the limited resources uh, that each government will have. And so it assumes that we have access to all this. Uh, we now talk about digitalization. So a lot of countries talk about uh, digital economy, talk about the fourth industrial revolution, etc. And I think uh, it's very beneficial for other sector in terms of using data analytics. Um, I mean, during this pandemic, the ability to track um, uh, to do contact tracing through digital uh, platform is really uh, um, uh, critical. Uh, but from the financial sector, this digitalization is uh, or digitization is more uh, towards helping risk management and financial inclusion. And I want to stress on, here on financial inclusion. A lot of the time when we uh, speak about digitizations in the financial sector, um, we want to promote access to credit, access to payment, access to deposit and insurance. Those are the four basic uh, uh, products uh, when we talk about financial inclusion. Um, but access to uh, deposit, access to credit and insurance have a prerequisite from the person. So saving, for instance, you need to have spare saving. Um, to, to open a saving account, you need to have spare saving. Uh, to access credit, you have to have a past credit history, or you have to prove certain cash flow. An insurance product is also quite a complex instrument for somebody who has very little knowledge about uh, financial matters. So payment is probably the way to go because payment transactions happen to any walks of life. Uh, regardless, you're rich, you're poor, you will still need to pay for something. And so in terms of accessing to payment, uh, this is where Having a proper payment infrastructure in place uh, is very important. And experience from the ground here in Cambodia, we, we have, we, in the past, uh, we have different uh, structure in our financial system. We've got the bank, we've got the payment service provider, and we've got the uh, microfinance institutions. The bank's payment system are connected to each other via the central bank uh, clearinghouse. Uh, but the payment service provider are completely on a standalone basis. So. If you are a user of a customer of one payment service provider, you tend to want to stick to that uh, payment service provider. And whoever interact with you, if you're a supplier or buyer of a company, if they use one provider, you will have to stick to that provider. You can't use a different provider because the interconnectivity uh, is not there. And so it makes it very inconvenient and costly for, for the users. 
So what we're trying to do uh, now in Cambodia is to connect the banks uh, together to the payment service provider and the payment service provider together. And create this uh, interoperability is very essential because you're not basically connecting the digital platform, but you're also connecting people in the urban area who are mostly using uh, the banking sector, and you're connecting uh, to the people in the rural area who are mostly using the uh, e-wallet provider. So you're creating this interoperability, uh, but also you connect two different segments of the market together. So that's the, 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 the um, in terms of the domestic infrastructure. And we are also talking about our neighboring country in terms of trying to connect our domestic infrastructure to our neighboring country infrastructures. And here I'm talking about uh, migrant workers. Um, recently, the Bankers Associations of Cambodia and the Bankers Association in Thailand uh, tried to come up with an MOU, signing an MOU where we try to encourage uh, migrant workers to remit money back home through a formal channel. Um, and this is going to be really a challenge, and I, I, I don't know how this is the study is going to uh, 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 result. Uh, but to get a proper ID for illegal migrant workers is going to be really a challenge. Now, can bank address this uh, to other form of identifications? Uh, we need to see. Um, so that's one challenge, but at least there is a, a, a study is going on. But even though you're going to a formal uh, uh, cross-border payment infrastructure, the cost is still high, because if you look at uh, remittances, uh, it usually go between 20 to 30%. Right, but it's still better than remitting money through an informal sector, which are really high risk. And so, uh, creating first of all, you push them into the formal sector, and then how you can make these formal remittances less uh, costly for them. So we're now we Cambodia is also now working with a, a bank in Malaysia, where we would want to allow a lot of, and this is something very personal to me because. A lot of the, the, the migrant worker, uh, Cambodian migrant workers going to Malaysia are women uh, working in, in a household. And so there are instances where these women remit money back home uh, in a bulk, um, so once a month to, hope to their, uh, their family in Cambodia. And the money can sometimes, uh, thanks God it's not always like this, but can, can sometimes be used for the wrong purpose. Right, so this is, can be really uh, devastating for the women who are working really hard and the money is not getting used for what she thought it's going to be used for. Um, so we wanted to create a way where these women can send money home any time of the day, free of charge, uh, to pay directly to the school, to the utilities, to the hospital, etc., without having to worry that her money will be mismanaged by family members. And we are trying to do this through a peer-to-peer -peer channel, which is uh, using a DLT technology where this can be done any time of the day um, without any intermediaries. Of course, the information uh, is there. But again, uh, we stumble on some issues mostly pertaining to um, identifications, KYC uh, um, challenges. <laughs> Well, that's a great segue to our next speaker, uh, Nikhil. You know, you have um, were you know very active in creating the uh, India stack, which was focused on identity, and you've also worked with a number of entrepreneurs and, and other ventures in um, launching uh, new businesses that are built on national digital infrastructure. So we've just heard from Sarai some you know great examples of how. Um, when we speak in general terms, efficiency of, of uh, payments and a switch and the rails, um, but really translates to you know trust and a difference in the life of a migrant worker who's sending um, essential money home to her family. Uh, what are some of the, the examples and stories that you have of how entrepreneurs and others really benefit from national digital infrastructure? Thank you so much, Conan, and uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, just to share from our experience, uh, uh, in, especially in India, we, where we have similar challenges of, you know, giving a digital identity, giving access to information, access to the banking system, uh, we've kind of seen this play in like two, two parts. Uh, one is the regulatory and the policy infrastructure coming into place to build some of these public goods, as we've, you know, as, as Her Excellency was talking about. Uh, there is a need for the government and the regulators to play a proactive role in shaping the digital economy and thereby building these fundamental building blocks around identity, payments, 
you know, uh, e-signatures, data framework, and so on and so forth. And I kind of think about a lot of this, you know, uh, public infrastructure being done, you know, just like the way uh, the U.S. government many, many years ago spent, uh, you know, time and money and research into building things like the GPS, the Internet was a government-initiated project. Uh, and then when these public goods are, you know, made available and, you know, when, when innovators are invited to build on top of them, that's when we see magic happen, which is essentially, you know, changing the lives of consumers and small businesses. Uh, so a lot of the work that's happening around, especially even in India, uh, what we've done really well till now is the ability to, you know, we are seeing the first, these are the first order effects, right? The first order effects is that, I, as an Indian, I have a digital identity today. I have an app that any I can choose from a multiple different payment applications to, to do my digital payments and so on and so forth. And then this provides us this unique opportunity for us as entrepreneurs to think about, like, what can we build on top of this? Um, so you have the policy which enables this, and then you have the right set of platforms. Uh, which enable uh, which enable these you know digital identity e sign and you know payments as access and then there is this entire layer of product that needs to be built for for us to make this digital infrastructure meaningful to consumers and small businesses so this co-creation ecosystem is super important uh, you know as we've seen uh, especially even in India from our experience uh, so some of the examples you know where we are seeing uh, you know this this infrastructure being used is like, uh, as you know, the gig economy is something that's, that's been like really on the rise around the globe. Uh, by having a national digital infrastructure, a lot of these technology companies are now able to verify uh, mm -hmm. people's profile directly from the digital identity infrastructure and therefore be able to onboard them at lower cost. Um, you know, another example in the financial inclusion use case is, um, a lot of people who are not able to open bank accounts because due to the high cost of you know uh, opening bank accounts and servicing them, the cost of those uh, account opening and servicing has become so low that people are able to now you know open different types of financial accounts, not just bank accounts, but like credit accounts, insurance accounts, you know even investment accounts and so on and so forth. Um, so we're seeing this change happen from you know not having access. So now that we have this fundamental building blocks that are in place, and then we are seeing the second order effects play out. For example, if you take digital payments, uh, we're seeing a massive digitization of bill payments that happen in our country. Uh, you know, uh, and, and for bill payments to happen digitally, you need to have a foundational digital payments infrastructure that enables this to happen. Uh, Similarly, you know, and, and this kind of also shows uh, in, in like the re reduction in cash circulation in the country where there's more and more commerce that's happening digitally now. So all of these second order effects have started to play out. Uh, and uh, and this is uh, in, in, in India, we call this Jugal Bandi, uh, which is essentially if, if you've seen any Indian musician or a concert where there are two different musical instruments playing together to form a tune or think about like a band a jazz band or a blues band where the guitarist and the pianist and both are together play. So similarly, the regulator and the innovation ecosystem, which is the entrepreneurs, have to play this uh, together so that we can have this positive impact on the society. On the society. Uh, so that's essentially what we're seeing. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, what's in store for the next 10 years. Uh, I think this, you know, this decade will be about like, or we've set up the rails of these fundamental, I think, you know, we'll see massive impact in uh, non-linear change happen in the next 10 years than with what we saw in the last 10 years. And I think that that co-creation ecosystem that you mentioned is, is really essential. And it's exciting that these national infrastructures are creating a platform where then private entrepreneurs and entities and new ventures and people who just have great ideas uh, can really build on a solid foundation and create those new enterprises that will keep driving society forward. So Ben, as we as we turn to you, you've worked, you're you know, now at the Bank for International Settlements, the, the BIS Innovation Hub um, in Singapore, but you've also worked at the Bank of England on sort of new identity and, and payment products. Um, and as you think about the end beneficiaries, you know, what were some of the, the things that really stood out for you or, or thoughts of, again, about the impact of the work that you've been doing? 
interested? Yeah, so my, my current focus is really on the kind of cross-border aspects of these um, foundational digital infrastructures. So a couple of examples of, of the problems that people are facing on the ground. The average uh, cost of sending uh, a $200 remittance at the moment is about 6.8%. So if you're working in one country and sending money home to your family, uh, you're losing nearly 7% of that just on the, the fees to send that money back. Um, and that's a, uh, you know, that's a significant chunk of your earnings uh, to lose just to make the payment. Um, in addition, around a billion people don't have any form of digital identity at all. Uh, so that means uh, you don't get access to uh, the payment system. Um, it becomes harder to get other financial products, and, you, and you're essentially excluded from the financial system. Um, so there are countries that have done amazing work uh, domestically to provide better payment systems, uh, more financial inclusion, and um, uh, digital identities. Um, but there's still an issue about how these work when you go across borders. And um, for, for a large number of people, that, that has... Uh, a number of significant disadvantages, um, and but there's also a lot of potential if you provide that infrastructure uh, to improve that situation there. Conan, I think you're on mute. Now, now I can be part of the uh, famous SFF uh, intro clip of your own. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think that you know we we heard uh, earlier that interoperability was one of the key challenges. I think it always has been with technology, and you know that it will just you know continue as we work on um, these questions of digital identity and, and payments. And that's certainly something at the IF that we've been focused on. We've launched a, a new Open Digital Trust initiative, uh, which is uh, uh, helping to support you know policy initiatives for open source. Um, digital identity initiatives, and keeping um, the the systems you know sort of open and federated so that that interoperability standard um, can be pursued, I think is something that's uh, really important, and we look forward to working with a lot of people on. And as we think about building these blocks of um, the future infrastructure, Nikhil, I was wondering if we could come to you next. We've already heard a little bit from all of you of some of the things that you've been working on already, but I think that's one of the, the great advantages that the audience has from you today is that you're all people who have you know, dove in early and were really pioneers in, in helping to create this stack. So anything more that you might share about the you know, BIN app and the, the India stack um, and uh, maybe you know, success uh, stories or some of the challenges and problems that you um, identified in that work? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think like uh, one of the things that, uh, yeah, you know, people uh, will probably, I, I would like to share is like, you know, I think the ability to think like the long term and large is very important when we think about like designing these platforms. Um, a lot many times I've found people uh, not being very patient about change. Uh, all good change in society takes long time, you know, and, uh, and our hope with building some of this digital infrastructure is like, can we accelerate this change? You know, you can't like slip around and day and say, hey, look, you know, can we just change the, change the book around? And, you know, because essentially what we're trying to do is like bring about behavioral changes in people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then these behavioral changes take time. And, you know, and there's a lot of education and awareness, et cetera, that needs to go in. Mm -hmm. um, however, what's been very surprising is, you know, uh, I think uh, it's also a lot about like the right timing uh, for the for that enabling infrastructure to exist for all of these things to happen. Um, are you guys also getting noise? Ah, okay, uh, much better now. Uh, so a lot of the enabling infrastructure is required for you know some of these things to happen. For example, a lot of countries look into India and look at the unified payments interface. Uh, today, you know, in the last four years, we've gone from, you know, zero to 200 million people uh, being digitally impaneled to, you know, start doing digital payments. And, you know, we do around like two and a half billion transactions every month. Uh, however, for this uh, infrastructure to actually be put in place, India had to, you know, give a digital identity to everybody. Uh, and then therefore, 
once they everybody had a digital identity we had to have a financial inclusion program which enabled everybody to open a bank account and then once everybody opened a bank account then we had to have the right layer of the digital payments layer to you know work on top of this uh some of the things that i found were like really interesting and which is kind of uh, when i started i'm actually not a banker uh, so i'm an engineer who happened to stumble upon financial inc- my parents are bankers they were rural bankers for like 30 35 years and i'd only learned about banking you know in a rural setup understanding it from branches and people going in there and so on so when i started working on this for me it was this fascinating thing about like okay what can apis do uh, you know the idea of money being programmable um, and the idea that you could build something that you know that could impact uh, where you can innovate and then build experiences that you were not able to do before that thing was very fascinating um, one fascinating tidbit is like when we launched upi which is the unified payments interface which is our digital public payment system uh, it was actually launched in bangalore uh and not in bombay um mumbai or bombay is the financial capital of india and uh, you know and typically everything the rbi the reserve bank of india and you know all the banks and everybody is based out of bombay but you know consciously we kind of launched upi with a hackathon in bangalore um so even before the bankers got to know about upi there were a bunch of you know 300 or developers who were actually in this conference in bangalore in a hotel and we flagged it off with a hackathon uh, and this is remember this is even before the central bank has finally approved the payment system before the banks have you know signed up on it to actually go live the membership scheme is still open it was just the idea that you know we want to do something like this and there were these api specs let's convert them into a sandbox and then launch this event and bring the innovation ecosystem and see what do they have to say about it We, uh, we ran this hackathon for a month and a half and there were like 3000 developers across the world who participated built a lot of crazy stuff you know some things that have not even come to life yet um, and that energy of people thinking about you know innovate you know way to product uh, the way they wanted to change the way you know we interact with money that energy that feedback cycle fed into you know the regulatory ecosystem the national payments corporation of india which which is like operating this platform and the banks uh, to say hey we should make this happen It looks like there is a market um so this product this idea that we are talking about um you know while it sounded it was a skunk works kind of a project it was not something you know upi was not designed with you know as big deal that it is today it was started with this very simple idea that can we unlock banking infrastructure and get you know people to you know come and collaborate and innovate so when we did this very small thing which is you know doing this hackathon getting people access to giving people access to this infrastructure nobody had access to api infrastructure before nobody knew what messaging formats bank used to transfer money and you know as soon as there was this like uh, api infrastructure a lot of people flocked to like work upon it and then that positive energy that you know that feedback cycle that we had led one thing to another so there were a lot of obstacles uh, you know it, you like they say you can have 99 reasons not to do it but you just needed one reason to make this happen um, and that one reason was this energy from the ecosystem saying hey we want to collaborate and build together um, so you know i can talk about all the 99 things that came our way and you know where there was a risk of this not happening but this was this one reason why it happened that there was you know there was tremendous energy and um, and you know excitement from the ecosystem to build on top of the infrastructure i i think that that's a great uh, story for people to hear the fact that opening up that api infrastructure launched 300 you know really creative entrepreneurs and who knows all the amazing things that will come from that energy um ben some some examples or stories or uh, things that you'd like to highlight in in your work um sort of building the blocks of digital identity and next gen payments yeah so so looking at cross border payments specifically um so there's two issues here around digital identity and payments infrastructure itself um so there are countries that have brilliant digital identity systems and you know india is a great example of that um these digital identity systems are usually designed with the domestic context in mind and it, one of the big issues with cross border payments one of the big frictions is around identity so uh every cross border payment that is made 
has to be uh, checked against sanctions lists. Um, it has to be checked for money laundering. Uh, and all of those checks really depend on information about the identity of the sender and the receiver. Um, with some of the current systems, that information may be incomplete, might be inaccurate. Sometimes it's even falsified. And uh, if you could imagine that you have these countries with well-developed uh, foundational digital identities, if you could connect the cross-border payment system into those uh, payment systems, sorry, connect the identity systems and the cross-border payment systems together, you've got the opportunity of eliminating a lot of those frictions, um, cutting out a lot of the costs and the delays in cross-border payments. Um, and that could have you know, benefits for uh, remittances, for um, cross-border corporate payments as well. Um, the other aspect of kind of linking together these uh, foundational infrastructures is linking up uh, fast payment systems. So the the payment systems that allow you to make a bank transfer within a few seconds or less than a minute. Um, again, those are usually designed uh, domestically. To link <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit of background noise, but um, uh, they're designed to link up domestic banks. And um, if you could actually link those up across border, um, you could enable almost instant cross-border payments. Um, so that is, you know, you're linking together different infrastructures, uh, making the digital identity systems open so that they can be uh, connected across borders. Um, but to do that, you have to design some of that functionality in from the beginning. So you have to make these systems open, uh, probably API based, uh, use standard uh, messaging formats like uh, ISO 222, if you can. Um, uh, and then that opens up all this opportunity to link these systems together. And, and you know, that's, as I mentioned before, certainly something that we see a uh, great opportunity with and the Open Digital Trust Initiative is, is working on just those issues, you know, standards, API standards, um, interoperability questions, uh, liability and reliance across uh, markets. Um, but Surya, if we could come to you next, I think as somebody who's um, you know, Ben is taking a global view and thinking about knitting the systems together. Um, but as somebody who's responsible for uh, a lot of the, the layers and the, the building blocks at a national level that that sits on, you've shared, you know, some of the, the drivers and, and the uh, successes of Project Bakong and other initiatives, but wondered if you um, had any other things that you wanted to uh, highlight or share as you, um, you know, build the blocks of uh, your new national systems. Yeah, um, yes, I think I, I want to echo uh, Ben in terms of the uh, cross-border. When, when I mentioned earlier about uh, how we explore different ways to, do, to, to allow our migrant workers to remit money back uh, efficiently and safely, one of the main stumbling block was the uh, KYC part of it. Um, and, and so then go back to what Ben said is, how can we connect the different domestic infrastructure together so that you don't have to, you know, um, for, for, for the user to every time send money to a mobile devices, for instance, to enter all the details. And, and that's really one of the main deterrent from using formal uh, services at all. Um, and so what we have been exploring, um, the, the global stack uh, where uh, Singapore, which has one of the best uh, uh, the digital infrastructure in the world, um, Singapore and a few other countries, including Cambodia, Kenya, and, and a couple of other countries, uh, try to come together and, and try to set up a, a, a guideline on standardization. So when each country builds their own global stack, um, we try to make sure that um, there's an, an open API where when we need eventually to do any cross-border, whether it's uh, on a, for trade purposes, whether it's for a merchant payment, we can connect this together and uh, things will go, you know, in uh, swiftly and without going to all these uh, uh, tedious uh, mechanism of, of checking the identity of the person or the businesses. Um, so this is something that we're, we're working with, uh, with the different countries as well. But every time we build a domestic infrastructure, what we have to have in mind is what's going around us, at least, if not the world, but at least within the region, our neighbors, uh, so that we can easily connect with them. Within the ASEAN, um, there is the um, ASEAN Payment Committee, where we try to come up with a standardized message 
uh, for everyone to uh, uh, adopt uh, so that if, we, if there were to be any cross-border messages, at least we can uh, read each other. Uh, we haven't gone into detail in terms of the ID infrastructure, but I think it is a matter of time that it would go into the discussion. So, um, again, um, working on a standalone for the domestic connectivity is good, but what would be even better is to be able to work across the border with our main trade partners uh, and our neighbors, etc. And that example of the global stack, you know, clearly one of the leading examples that we see around the world. And it's exciting to see not only what that can enable in financial services, um, but we also had a comment come in the, the uh, Q&A uh, chat thread here that highlighted how, for instance, in, in Kenya, um, some of these uh, identity stacks are really helping drive improvements in health. And I think you see that in a number of, um, of markets as well. And I think that that's another area I see some Nodding heads, uh, Nikhil. Any any comments on um, the uh, the impact of identity and health as well? Oh yes, uh, you know uh, India has taken up like a very uh, large program, a healthcare program called Ayushman Bharat, which is you know it, giving a medical insurance to over 500 million people. Uh, think about it like the health inclusion version of the financial inclusion wave that happened six seven years ago. And now, riding on top of that, uh, we're working on something called the National Health Digital Infrastructure System, uh, which is, think about it as the India stack equivalent. We call it the health stack. Uh, and the idea is, like, there's a lot of learning from the financial inclusion world, and we are applying that into another domain called healthcare. But broadly, a lot of these fundamental building blocks remain the same, which is having an ident a derived identity for your healthcare records, you know, having interoperable standards for your healthcare, I mean, your healthcare data, having a consent manager, which will unlock your data, you know, from multiple different uh, healthcare providers. Uh, so, so a lot of that is, uh, a lot of the learning from the financial inclusion world has been trying to be put into this. Uh, there's also a blue book that the government has released on what are these fundamental building blocks going to look like. Um, so definitely, yes, uh, you know, there is a lot to learn and apply it into a different segment. All societal problems need such intervention uh, where we think about building public infrastructure and enabling private innovation on top of it. Great. Well, one of the other things I know that we wanted to touch on today were sort of the do it now, no regret actions um, that we, we think uh, government should be taking. One of the challenges with this rapid digital innovation and uh, transformation in society is that I think you know governments knowing how to move and where to move and where to invest uh, resources that have you know lots of demands on them certainly at a time like this um, can be hard. And so Ben, I was wondering if we could start with you if there were some places where you would recommend um, sort of no regret actions that that governments should be uh, taking today in in either digital identity or payments. Yeah, well, I, I think in both uh, using standards where you can. Um, one of the challenges with digital identity is just the, the variety of approaches that countries or companies have taken. Um, so where there are standards that you can use, that's that's always helps. Uh, building systems that are open. So if you're creating a digital identity system for access to government services, if you can make that open to the private sector as well, um, that increases the value of that system. Um, and then when when countries are building, uh, for example, domestic fast payment systems, uh, to to think about how those could be connected to systems in other countries at some point in the future, uh, so that you don't make design choices that restrict what can be done um, when you want to connect these systems. Um, I think those are really important uh, kind of design principles to to bear in mind whenever you build a payment system or a digital identity system. I think that's uh, some very good good advice there and hit all of our uh, certainly greatest hits at the IF of things that we would recommend as well. So, Rai, as you think about um, your peers uh, and, and chatting with your counterparts around the world, what are some things that you might recommend to them as no regret actions? Um, I think it's, it's to be open-minded and, uh, uh, and, and having a dialogue with the private sector. Um, a lot of the time, um, and I'm probably talking just for, 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 for us, I mean, central banking uh, initially is a very secretive society in a way where um, we rarely share anything with uh, anyone. 
Um, but I think things have been evolving so fast and our communication is, is really a thing uh, to communicate what we're doing in terms of monetary policies, in terms of our uh, financial stabilities, and, and now in terms of this infrastructure. So having an open-minded and, and accept um, the, the, the changes that is happening is, is really important. Um, second of all, I think that um, when we were, if we want to develop an infrastructure, for instance, it, it's very important to get the uh, regulators um, to be involved. Um, a lot of the times when, if you were to leave everything to the private sector, which is sometimes understandable because of the limited resources of the regulators or the government, um, resources, financial resources and human resources, um, oftentimes it's very hard to get everyone onto the say, on the, to that particular platform because of competitions, right? Why would I go and join somebody else's uh, platform and not creating my own, right? Um, so when if you if you have a regulator coming um, together and even if it, it were to join hand with someone from the private sector, then it create this trust that you've mentioned, uh, where the other players will be more willing to join and participate, and that's exactly. Um, the reason why the, the National Bank of Cambodia come up with this initiative. And there's some criticism that, you know, we, we're doing too much, uh, we may be competing with the private sector, but at some point in time, you've got to balance your, your actions. And, and you say, look, um, I, I may be uh, driving one or two players out of the market because this, but then um, the majority will benefit of this uh, infrastructure that I'm putting in place. Um, so it's it's a, it's it's not an easy decision, and this is why I said discussions, dialogue with the private sector is very important uh, to understand each other's uh, end goal. And I think that that's you know particularly important because we're talking about um, some paradigm changes and ch paradigm changes in how the technology is being developed and rolled out. You have. Uh, a lot of developments outside of the regulatory perimeter of financial services happening in society. You have the advent of embedded finance and, you know, real uh, changes in how uh, customers want to use and engage with financial services moving forward. So thinking all of that through and engaging early to understand how the ecosystem is changing, um, what these new technologies enable, and uh, opening um, those channels of communication um, between industry and, and the regulators you know, all very, uh, very good advice. Uh, Nikhil, your your thoughts on sort of no regret actions as someone who's gone through now sort of two cycles of, um, of uh, you know, different developments. What are some things that you might um, share with governments around the world who are trying to figure out what their path forward should be? Well, I mean, um, given the place, I'm an engineer, like I said, so I think like, uh, you know, governments need to consult a lot more or bring technology people to design technology systems, not the policies, but technology systems. Uh, because, you know, everybody's got their own area of expertise. Uh, for a long time, uh, you know, uh, the way, like, a lot of these technologies in the bank, you know, we keep talking about this, right? So it's banking systems are archaic, blah, 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 so on and so forth. There is a lot of talent available out there uh, where you know people who have built internet scale systems uh, and then getting them to come and design your architecture, having a very sound technology board from day one. You know, remember we're talking about digital is is the first word that we use, uh, you know, in all of this. So it's important that we give that you know weightage to that so that we get the right design, uh, we get the right set of components, uh, you know, use a lot of open source. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the public infrastructure in India is actually built on open source, uh, which brings down the cost of the infrastructure itself. Uh, and in order for you to be able to do that, you need to bring people who have been there and done that. If you bring the uh, you know if you bring these services or technology companies which which thrive on these contract based stuff of change requests and so on, you're going to end up with the same legacy architecture that banks have. But if you want to do this paradigm shift. Uh, and think about it like internet companies and use a lot of open source, you need people who've been there and done that. Um, and luckily, there are enough people in the technology industry who now want to give back to the society. Um, I almost think about it like a startup trying to hire a missionary to join their mission. I think it, this is something that the government and the regulatory environment can also do. 
because that gives them a lot of superpower areas which you know they don't understand really well you know having somebody who you trust and you know who who can be like who can evaluate all the options that are there cut the noise right because a lot of this the, the lot of issues is like there's too many opinions a lot of people are going to come and say do it this way do it that way but if you can have somebody you know who's kind of been the champion who's been there done that uh that that is something that i think like you know that's that's something that's worked really well for us in india where technologists have made decisions of how technology should be and policy makers make decisions of how policy should be uh ben uh anything that you might want to to riff off of there i think you started us you know very well talking about open systems open standards and kill has picked up a lot of those um themes as as well and as we think about you know, I think the challenge here, you know, Nikhil, you use the words like trust and consent quite a bit uh, in a couple of different contexts. But I think that that's really what we're building in the next generation of national digital infrastructure is how do you um, sort of digitize trust and consent? And how do you do it in a framework that's consistent with the values of society and things like privacy um, sort of and, and recourse um, and consent? And, you know, I think that's one of the challenges is that as as a world we're now that's um sort of becoming coded and reflected in 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 um uh digital code uh not just in in legal code so ben as somebody who has a, a global perspective and sees some of the different trends emerging there you know any comments on how you how societies um how do you deal with that challenge of interoperability that we all mentioned many times we're all seeking common standards and interoperability but when you're really coding society's uh, consent trust and privacy how do you uh, deal with those things and and has that something that the bis uh, working across so many markets has seen recently the the privacy and data protection side of this is really tricky so um you know take an example singapore has a great uh national digital identity system um within singapore you can connect to that system to pull information which allows you to sign up for you know bank accounts more easily uh, register for other services um it's difficult to imagine that um companies in other countries would be able to connect to that system uh and that the identity providers would be comfortable sharing that information across borders you know they don't know how it might be used they may not be comfortable with the data protection regime in a particular country um and uh, and obviously the more countries you have the more inconsistencies you have between those data protection regimes so if you're sharing identity across borders um you, you have to think about the best way to do that and it may not be uh having a direct link into somebody else's identity system but for example the user pulling the information from that identity system uh the identity system actually uh signing that information to say that this this is genuine information that came from us and could only have come from us um but the user then actually choosing to share that information themselves across borders um so this this is a really you know it's a it's a tricky uh part of it um there's also kind of interesting developments in cryptography so around things like zero knowledge proofs where you can um prove information without revealing the underlying inf- uh, the underlying information itself um that technology is still quite new uh it's quite computationally heavy so it's uh not necessarily ready for uh you know a payments context where you have to process something within a few seconds um but there's some really interesting developments there that could kind of give a solution to some of these uh privacy issues Nikhil, any any um thoughts on sort of what you've seen working through that uh that issue set? Well, I mean, I think like we're very early on this uh the 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 like the data empowerment journey. I think uh uh one flip that we have been able to like do that in India is like, you know, while there's a lot of focus on privacy as uh you know as as a core value to the user we have actually flipped that script around to say can we instead think about it as data empowerment um by you know by giving ac- users access to their data back uh so that the users can use the data for like their prosperity whether it is 
to get a better credit, um, you know, or to be able to apply for a job that they were not able to improve themselves and so on. Uh, so I think there is, uh, in, in a lot of countries like India, uh, where, you know, where the Western models were a lot about like building, you know, use your data and do ad tech, right? Where you're trying to sell more increased consumption. Uh, but India and, you know, many countries like us, we are we're technically poor. So there's no consumption. There's no ads that you can push to these people. So instead, we need to think about using data in a, in a way that empowers them, uh, you know, socially. Uh, so which is why, you know, we've been talking about data, not just from a privacy angle, that's there, that, that's like a minimum stakes, but can we think about it from an empowerment angle? So that, you know, it's not just unlocking data, but also like enabling users of this data to like, as, as Her Excellency was talking about, like, can we, people don't have credit scores. So, you know, can we unlock financial data so that someone can build an underwriting engine or based on their cash flows and be able to give a credit or a loan to them. Uh, so this empowerment angle is very important. Uh, we have to move not just, you know, by table stakes, privacy is table stakes, but we also need to think about like what kind of applications can be built on top of that. And, and as you mentioned, unintended consequences of some of those uh, moves have have surfaced lately as people realized, oh, wait a minute, if we if instead of mining data for for advertising, you know, everything's behind paywalls, uh, does that all of a sudden start excluding a lot of people um, from the environment who who might not have the means to participate? Um, or you know might not be um, attractive customers. Uh, so lots of lots of things to think through there. Well, as we um, wind down, I, I thought we might do a speed round of of sort of um, parting words. And again, we started off, I think, with a really powerful vision of what this means for people. And I think if we could end on that note as well, um, it would be uh, it would be great. So maybe we'll we'll go. Um, uh, ben, Nikhil, and then end with your excellency. But uh, Ben, um, parting words on the impact and why all of this is uh, is so important and what it can do for the world. Yeah, I, th I think huge opportunities here. Um, there's a lot of frictions for people at the moment, a lot of costs, um, uh, particularly uh, the less well off, really. Um, and just linking some of these systems together, making some of them a bit more open, uh, could really start to solve some of those problems on a on a global scale as well. And Nikhil, uh, I, I shared this before, Conan. So you know, 30 years ago, we had you know one of the first public goods GPS come about, and uh, 30 years later, we have a Tesla self-driving car. Uh, I think you know uh, we're investing in these building blocks of public goods and financial services now, and I. I hope it doesn't take us 30 years to, you know, build self-driving money, but I think we're probably five to six or 10 years away. So I'm very excited about the next 10 years coming forward. And the final word, Your Excellency. Well, I think the reason why we're doing what we're doing right now, talking about it is infrastructure and, and connectivities. The, the main purpose is inclusion. And inclusion, not for the sake of inclusions. I mean, what the end goal here is to uh, reduce poverty and achieve equity around the world. So um, we always hope that we always carry that end goal in mind and not doing something just for the sake of, you know, having it connected or, or, or such. Well, as uh, our economy and world continue to transform digitally, um, thank you very much for sharing why it's important to get the national digital infrastructure in place today. We certainly have a number of key takeaways from this discussion. Thanks to Conan for leading the discussion and his esteemed panel of speakers for their contribution to the discussion.